Okay, we are live on Facebook. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the HIV Awareness and Education webinar um, hosted by the City of Miami and our wonderful partners, the All of Us Research Program. The All of Us Research Program is a National Institutes of Health funded program. Um, it is seeking 1 million or more people from across the entire United States. By doing so, it hopes to one day help speed up medical research. People who join will share information about their health habits and what it's like where they live, and will also receive DNA information about themselves. By looking for patterns, researchers may learn more about what affects people's health. And as HIV Awareness Month rapidly approaches in December, and World AIDS Day on December 1st, we wanted to host this event to spread awareness and education of this very treatable condition. Leading today's discussion will be two esteemed doctors and researchers. First, introducing Dr. Michael Kolber, who is the Director of Comprehensive AIDS Program, Clinical Director of the Adult HIV Section for Infectious Diseases, and Professor of Medicine at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Joining Dr. Kober is Dr. Ovin Carasquillo. He's a national expert in minority health, health disparities, and community-based participatory research. As the Chief of Division of General Internal Medicine at the University of Miami, Dr. Carasquillo is also a principal investigator for the All of Us Research Program at the University of Miami. So we do thank both of you for joining us. And without further ado, we wanna get started on diving in to learn a little bit more about HIV. So firstly, my first question is to Dr. Kober. Dr. Kober, in very general language, do you mind explaining exactly what HIV is? No, uh, well, first, thank you for inviting me. Um, HIV is a virus um, and it infects us um, mostly through sexual contact. Uh, there are other routes such as IV drug abuse and uh, congenitally when uh, during the birth, uh, a mother can transmit HIV to her child. And it's a virus that uh, once it gets inside of you, replicates in the immune cells. Those are cells that protect you from infection, uh, specifically one type of those cells. Uh, and, and it grows and produces a high viral burden. And uh, people can be with HIV for many, many years before they experience uh, uh, decreasing immunity because it starts destroying the cells that it infects, which are immune cells that are protective. Um, and as you reach a certain level, you develop what we call AIDS once your immunity has been severely compromised, which makes you uh, vulnerable to infections that you, not, you would not normally have. Thank you so much. And, and you started answering the second question, which is what is the difference between HIV and AIDS? Um, so do you mind elaborating just a little bit further? Right. So again, HIV is what we call the virus that infects you. AIDS is the condition uh, that has been um, the terminology we use for individuals whose HIV disease has gotten so bad they can't fight off either various infections or various tumors. Uh, and so once your immunity, which protects you from these diseases, is compromised, uh, there are levels that we call it to be AIDS. Thank you. And, and I know some individuals have had some questions. Are HIV and AIDS the same thing? Um, how would you answer that, Dr. Colbert? So AIDS is HIV, but HIV is broader than AIDS. So if you think of a large circle and call that HIV, you may have a circle within it, which we call AIDS. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Garasquillo, I want to um, just go over to you just so that we give you a little bit some love in between. We want to go back and forth. Um, one of the questions I want to ask you are about the symptoms. Um, what are some of the symptoms of HIV disease? Um, and what is your first indicator with your patients if they should be tested for it? And you're on mute. I'm sorry. Um, uh, you know, 
as far as HIV testing, I advise everyone to make sure they get an HIV test. Everyone should be, you know, screened for AIDS, and that's critically important. Um, and anyone that's engaged in any uh, high risk, high risk behavior, uh, having unprotected intercourse uh, with somebody outside of long term partner, should definitely be uh, tested. Anyone that's engaged in any IV drug use uh, also needs to be periodically tested uh, for HIV. So those are critical. And the most important thing I tell people is that oftentimes people don't know when they develop AIDS, uh, HIV, uh, when they contract HIV. And so that's why it's always important uh, if you had unprotected intercourse or something like that, that you uh, should be tested and then have a follow-up test after that. It's really important because many times you don't develop any signs or symptoms. Sometimes there are things like a rash. Sometimes you can have cold-like illness. Uh, sometimes you can have... Um, things like uh, your lymph nodes, uh, some of your lymph nodes getting a little bit big, but many times you don't have any of these uh, symptoms. So that's why it's important to make sure you get tested. Uh, but I'll let Dr. Colbert add to that because I'm sure he has a lot more information on that. Well, I think that's basically correct. Um, the level of, uh, I, I don't wanna to get too technical, but the level of symptoms correlates pretty well with the viral burden in your body. So if you have a lot of virus that's uncontrolled, you may be much sicker than if you have a much lower level of virus in your uh, blood. But Dr. Catasquillo has it absolutely correctly. It varies from no symptoms to cold, flu-like symptoms to even in, um, symptoms that will incapacitate you. Thank you so much. And I know you mentioned viral burden and that being an indicator um, of your immunity. Um, but let's ask a question about, do you need to have symptoms to be infectious or, um, if you do have symptoms, are you more infectious? How would you answer that question? Yeah. So you don't need to have symptoms to be infectious. You need to have a viral load to be infectious. Um, and however, the higher the viral burden the easier it is for you to potentially infect somebody else. Understand, I, I don't think most people realize, it only takes one virion to infect you, one virus. So uh, it, it ain't a whole lot. You don't need a million of them. The data suggests there's usually one or two viruses that infect you. Great, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Kolber, so somebody um, wants to get an HIV test. They're unsure about the accuracy of HIV tests. Um, can you talk about how accurate HIV tests are? Uh, yeah. Um, so like all other viral testing that we do today, there are multiple platforms, ways to test HIV. Uh, so there's the rapid testing, which is highly sensitive and specific nowadays, greater than 90 plus percent. So people who do a rapid test uh, and are tested positive will go on to do what we call a confirmatory test, which is uh, generally a, let's just, a PCR or what we call a nuclear amplification test, one of the two. Uh, and those are usually pathognomonic when they're positive. So if you have a positive rapid test, uh, you generally get a confirmatory test, but generally a positive rapid test is positive. Thank you so much. And um, there is some dis uh, discussion about what is the difference between an antibody test and an antigen test. Um, can you shed, shed some light on that? Yeah. Um, so we don't, uh, currently we do both those tests together. I mean, when we do the rapid testing. Uh, an antibody is, um, as you probably know by now, is a um, immunologic um, humoral particle that is created to recognize an antigen. An antigen is basically um, uh, immunologically recognizable um, a peptide uh, of the virus. So it's the piece of the virus is the antigen. Let's just say it simply. It's a piece of a virus. The antibody and the kind we usually talk about are look like Ys, just literally like the letter Y. And at the ends of the short part of the Y, which would be this part up there, uh, that is what looks at the antigen. So if it binds to an antigen, uh, if you have an antibody 
that we would that would effectively bind to these antigens, that's the HIV. That's an antibody that your body has made to recognize the antigen. The antigen, the immunologic particle, the virus particle, is indeed a particle of the virus. So one is what our body makes, and one is what the virus is. Great, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Karaski, I'm gonna go to you now, because I know that you had mentioned that you um, recommend that everybody get um, HIV tested or, or all your patients. Um, if somebody wants to know how often they should get tested individually, um, is there any time frame as to how often somebody should get tested for HIV? And if so, why or why not? Yeah, um, and obviously if you've never been tested, you should be tested, that's number one. Um, and then uh, the question is how often, as often as you continue doing our risky behaviors. Um, you know, so people ask me, I have unprotected sex with lots of different partners every day. And I'm like, then you should be, be tested a lot. I mean, I don't know what the right answer is. Maybe every three months or something very frequently is a good answer. Maybe Dr. Kober has to that. But as long as you continue doing things that put you at HIV, it's critically important you get tested very often because there are excellent medicines right now that can be used uh, and that can help. Uh, so it's critically important we pick it up as early as possible and also lets you know. But the right answer is, um, instead of focusing on how often you should be tested, what I try to uh, pay much more attention to is try to prevent those behaviors that are causing you to be uh, at risk for HIV. Because that's really what we want to uh, focus on and not how frequently people that continue doing stuff that puts them at risk should be tested for. Um, I'll ask Dr. Kober, uh, so how often do you recommend people that are actively engaged in risky behavior be tested? Right. So. Yeah, that's it. So I think you're, um, I don't know if you can hear me. Everybody seems frozen. Um, no, you're you, good. Okay. So I think Dr. Kataskio has it absolutely correct. Um, first, we want people to practice what we call safer sex, um, which means either use condoms or pre-exposure prophylaxis, which we'll probably talk about later. Um, and if you're engaging in these activities, there's never too many times you can be tested, in my opinion. Um, it does take some time to develop uh, positive antibodies or antigen uh, that we can measure. So if you are if you have unsafe sex one day, we probably would test you negative the next day. So, um, but uh, again, Dr. Kedeskew, it has it right. It's, it's, it's a crapshoot, I hate to tell you. Um, you know, you don't know how, when you're gonna get it. And, um, and so the recommendation is to, you know, test frequently. Uh, there's no number. Great, no, no, that's great to know. Thank you so much. Um, another question is um, regarding transmission. Does there have to be a cut or a tear in the skin for HIV? to be transmitted or essentially get inside somebody else's body? Again, uh, the majority of the cases that um, are either through um, so either penetration of uh, vaginal or rectal. Um, and in those cases, we don't believe that there is a cut. We just believe that there's a mucosal uh, barrier, which is like the inside of your mouth, when we talk about the mucosa, you have that in the vaginal area, you have it on the, um, the penis as well, when the foreskin is retracted, and you have it in the rectum. And uh, once uh, a viral particle can get into that, uh, which is not uh, necessarily a cut, uh, it can infect you. Now you can get infections if you have blood in an open cut, you get a needle puncture. That's a whole different area. Um, and we have preventive measures that we can initiate uh, quickly in that regard as well. Thank you, Dr. Cobra. And I know you already discussed some of the common ways um, HIV is spread. Um, can we just elaborate a little bit more? Um, because I know we, we had that, you had mentioned it before this question. Um, so I wanna just have it in some context. What are some of the common ways HIV is spread? Well, again, the most historically, it used to be blood transfusions used to be a way we have abrogated that um, pretty much uh, because there's testing for HIV in the blood. Uh, the majority occurs through sexual either intercourse vaginally or rectally. 
um, that's the vast majority. Then we still see a um, significant amount of trans um, HIV in individuals who share needles. So, um, and that's why uh, these needle exchange programs are critically important. And I might as well just say we have one in Miami. It's called the Idea Exchange for anyone who is using needles. I highly recommend you go to that and exchange your needles and um, prevent the transmission. Uh, there are countries that have been dominated by uh, intravenous drug use. Indonesia, for example, when you look at the data, the data uh, demonstrates that in that country, the a significant fraction of the HIV occurred through uh, uh, dirty needles. Um, and then you can, children can get it, as I indicated, if your mother is HIV positive and she's not on therapy, uh, it can be transmitted to the fetus as it's be through the birth canal. Uh, they can transmit it through uh, milk, um, mother's milk. And in some countries where they chew uh, food before they give it to the children, they can transmit it that way. Those are highly uncommon in the United States. Well, right. Thank you so much. And I know you, you we started to touch a little bit about data. Um, so I wanted to go over some data that I, that I know of. Um, when looking at the highest rate of HIV um, across the, the country, we do see that Miami or Miami-Dade County is, is ranked very high. Um, the numbers I saw from 2019 ranked Miami as number two in the highest rate of HIV infections. Um, I saw that there are about over 25,000 individuals living with HIV in the Miami, Miami-Dade County area. Um, of those individuals, a high majority of them are people of color. So my question now is for Dr. Carasquillo, why are people of color um, disproportionately affected by HIV in this country? Overall, just in this country, I mean, especially in Miami, but in this country, why? And I'll take a, you know, I'll take a little bit of a, you know, go on a little tangent, then I'll circle back. Uh, and then I'll let uh, Dr. Kolber finish the answers that he is part of running a center that's specifically funded to address that exact question um, you asked. Um, but when we deal with a lot of diseases, uh, sometimes people are surprised why do racial ethnic minorities have higher rates of heart disease or higher rates of diabetes, um, you know, higher rates of cancer? When we saw COVID, we saw COVID um, disproportionately strike minority populations worse. And everyone is surprised, you know, why is that happening? And it's the same with HIV. I mean, we like to talk a lot about something called the social determinants of health. Um, in essence, um, it talks about that there's a lot of underlying reasons that place minorities at high risk for many of these conditions. Um, you know, when you think of diabetes, for example, obesity, but obesity is just part of things like diet and exercise. You think about access to healthy, nutritious foods, what populations have that? Uh, facilities for doing exercise, all those things that are uh, people taking their medicines. Well, people under a lot of stress, a lot of our competing demands, if they're unemployed, if they're homeless, for example, how are you gonna make sure that they take their insulin three or four times a day, for example? So there's a lot of things that put minorities at higher risk for a lot of these chronic diseases. And HIV is no different from any other chronic disease. When you think about HIV and in low-income populations, when you think about a lot of these risky behaviors that Dr. Colbert was talking about uh, in terms of uh, sexually promiscuous behavior, um, for example, or intravenous drug use, uh, you know, what drives a lot of that stuff? A lot of it is the same social problems of, uh, you know, unemployment, stress, uh, depression, uh, but many of the social problems that affect our society, which are disproportionately con uh, concentrated in minority populations. So in many ways, HIV follows the same patterns as most other chronic diseases and affect minority populations the hardest. And that's why we talk a lot, you know, you're not gonna get end um, AIDS really until you really start addressing a lot of the stuff like homelessness, you know, um, like, you know, people that basically, you know, have, you know, ability to work, um, and ability to be, you know, stable social situations. So until a lot of that is corrected, we're going to have major problems with HIV. But I do have to hand it over to Dr. Colbert since the center was how many years? 25 years, 30 years already funded to address this problem in, in Miami Dade it, County? It's been over 30 years. Yeah. Um, so I think Dr. Kedeski hits on the point. You don't get HIV because you're Black. You don't get HIV because you're Hispanic. You don't get it because you're white. 
Uh, we know that social determinants of health are critically important in populations that get HIV. We know that people who don't have education may practice riskier behaviors. Um, we know that not having housing, not having food may predispose you to having work for sex, sex for money, those kind of activities. There may be other activities. Uh, so it's not your minority ethnicity that makes you have a disease. It's the circumstances under which you live that plays a significant role in this. Thank you, Dr. Kober. And, and our department, the Department of Human Services in the city of Miami, we do often look at the social determinants of health. Um, you know, a few years ago, Virginia Commonwealth University released its um, life expectancy rates. Um, and we looked at it and even noticed how our communities in Miami, you go into Overtown, they have a lower ex um, life expectancy. You just walk a couple blocks over to Brickell and they live more than 10 years longer. Um, so we do see that, that even just where we live um, plays a role in access and, and our own health. Um, so thank you so much for, for shedding that insight. Um, you know, we do want to talk a little bit about the stigma. I know a, a lot of, of, of the work in these spaces, um, we try to break down the stigma that comes with HIV and AIDS. Um, so let's, let's ask, ask some questions around stigma. Um, Dr. Kober, is it true that there are more homosexual men with HIV than any other group? Well, that's absolutely true. The data are clear like that. It's probably on the verge of 50%. The highest group, again, is the, uh, I would just say the African-American, Black individuals, followed by the Hispanic MSM, men who have sex with men, and then the um, white MSMs. But yes, MSMs constitute the largest population. Thank you. And, um, you know, some, um, you know, say, well, I'm not a homosexual man, so therefore I won't be at risk. Um, can you shed some light on, on that kind of uh, thought process? Yeah, well, I can't tell you why people think like that, uh, <laughs> but I can certainly tell you that it's not accurate. Um, so, I mean, if you practice unsafe sex, you are at risk. Um, there's a lot of people who uh, define for themselves what uh, having uh, being an MSM means. So we have a lot of people in our practice who do not think of themselves as men who have sex with men, but they are bisexual. So they have sex with women, they have sex with men, and yet they perceive themselves. So like everything else that's happening in our society, it's one of how you perceive yourself and at risk that you put yourself at. Um, so the answer is, no, you're at risk if you have unsafe sex that Dr. Kataskio talked about way at the beginning. Um, let's actually find out a little bit more about how manageable HIV or AIDS is. So is it a man manageable disease? Is there a treatment? Um, is there a cure? Um, Dr. Kober? Well, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> um, let me just start that we as, uh, have great therapies for HIV. We have one pill a day, well, which const the medicine, the one pill a day is really like three pills, but uh, you just take one a day, very few side effects, uh, and we can uh, reduce your viral burden, which is what we frequently look at, uh, and uh, control your immunity will be retained, and you'll do well. And people, we've had people in our practice just doing well for 20 to 30 years who take their medicine. So the medications, have come so far in the last 30 years. In the mid 1990s, when we were started with this HIV therapy, you'd have to take medicine four or five times a day, and you'd have to take handfuls of medicine. And you could fail it, meaning that if you didn't take it right, the virus would come right through and break out. Now the medications are so good, you can take one pill a day and uh, control your HIV. And now we know that there are shots um, that will treat you on a monthly basis. It, we're still learning how to use that. Now, to the second question is, can we cure HIV? Well, the answer is they have had functional cures to HIV. There are a couple of individuals who've had bone marrow transplants. I won't go into the, uh, and uh, they've had it with cells 
that don't become infected with HIV because there are some cells that miss what's called the co-receptor for HIV to bind to get in. So HIV needs just a little life cycle of HIV. HIV is a virus. It doesn't just enter cells. It has to bind to the cell. There are some receptors on that cell it needs to bind to before it gets in. Certain people don't have a receptor on their cell to bind HIV. With these cases, they treated these people with the bone marrow transplant with these cells. And lo and behold, one was named Timothy Green. He's no longer with us. Uh, he was the first person uh, and the Berlin patient, we call him. And he indeed uh, was able to uh, keep his virus undetectable. So he had a, what we call a functional cure, meaning functionally, he acted as if he didn't have HIV, although they could find virus in his GI tract. So the answer is yes, we can functionally cure HIV, but it ain't easy and it's extraordinarily expensive. And let me just tell you, getting a bone marrow transplant is not necessarily the safest thing in the world, but so... But, but it means we can cure it. So that's in itself a proof of concept. No, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, a little bit ago, Dr. Kober, you were discussing some ways that HIV can be transmitted. And uh -huh. you had mentioned, um, you know, through the birthing process, and you did use a little term that said, if they're not on therapy. Um, so I wanted to go in a little bit further about that. Um, as far as can you explain why is it that, you know, somebody who's on therapy will not pass it and somebody, you know, vice versa. Um, and then, and, and then of course I want to talk and, and this go into undetectable equals untransmittable. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So again, uh, again, the point being is if you can reduce the viral load to un undetectable, uh, you will not transmit to the baby. Um, and although it doesn't mean that if a baby is birthed to a mother who has HIV and she is undetectable, they won't keep the baby on antiretroviral therapy for a little while, but uh, that's basically what it is. If you can get the virus down low enough, it is difficult to transmit. That's basically what it is. So we try to get all infected mamas on therapy. Great. So now let's talk about um, just generally speaking, when any individual um, is undetectable, um, are they always untransmittable? Well, the answer is we never say always in medicine. I'm sorry to tell you. That's fine. Um, but uh, so, <laughs> so the data on that study suggested that the answer was 96 percent. Uh, and they felt that the one that the four percent came from an individual who was affected very early on. But uh, so we never say a hundred percent, but it's really low and uh, undetectable for most uh, for sexual encounters is is uh, untransmittable. It's a critical tenant that we try to go by, and it's working, to, it's one of the things we want to do for ending the HIV epidemic is to make anyone who is positive uh, undetectable. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Carasquillo, let me go back to you. What are some ways that people can prevent HIV? Well, I think you just heard one, uh, which was the people that have HIV uh, taking their medicines and reducing the viral load. So that's a major strategy, right? If you think about it, if everyone who's HIV positive had zero viral loads, uh, we would almost auto automatically address uh, this epidemic. Um, but then we also worked at it from different angles. So that's one angle. Uh, clearly, uh, as Dr. Cobra mentioned, for people that are engaged in IV drug use, which is one of the, you know, a big risk factor. Um, not using dirty needles is another way we could prevent HIV. Uh, and clearly a needle exchange programs. I wish there were a lot more of them. Uh, they've been very successful in many places and we have one, but that's clearly important. Uh, but the one that's really hard is talking to people about safe sex. I mean, that's a very difficult discussion. And I think a lot of the times when you talk, hey, just use a condom or you know, a female condom too, or something like that, you need to 
have a way to make these messages in a way that's socially acceptable and socially understandable. Uh, we use a lot of people called community health workers. These are lay people from the community that actually speak and talk in a way and can translate these messages better than somebody, you know, dressed in a white suit saying, you should always, you know, that kind of thing. So a lot of it is how we message and we get this across to people because that's critically important is communication uh, to make people engage up. It's really hard um, also to tell somebody who's a commercial sex worker, hey, you need to use it because they are a lot of times can't make these kind of demands from their partner or something like that. Um, but again, from my vision, uh, preventing HIV uh, long term is addressing all these things so that somebody doesn't have to choose to be a commercial sex worker so she could feed her baby, for example, or he, you know, or whatever it is, or those kind of things. So I tend to look at prevention uh, in those ways. And then obviously, most importantly, and I'll talk Dr. Colbert, you know, probably one of the greatest. Uh, you know, things we found the last 10 years is pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is another uh, great tool. And I don't know, Mike, you want to talk pre and post-exposure prophylaxis? Yeah. So, um, to so Dr. Teneschio opened the way for me to talk a little about ending the HIV epidemic. Um, in 2019, I don't want to, this is multiple lectures, but in 2019, um, a number of the divisions of HHS got together and decided that we have enough data in prevention to believe that we can end the HIV epidemic. One of the things you can do is treat people. Another thing is you can bring them into care very quickly once you've identified them, limiting the ability for them to transmit and suppressing them. And the second thing, or the third thing, whichever you want to call it, is pre-exposure prophylaxis large control, randomized control trial um, in about 2011 uh, uh, demonstrated that individuals who took um, a dual antiretroviral were protected from getting HIV effectively. Again, over 90 plus percent. Let's just talk about that. Uh, if you took it every day, the data now suggests that the the concentrations in your blood were so significant, uh, it protected men 99% uh, transmission from transmission. If you took it four times a week, it was 94%. In women, it's a little different. The data are not so good. They need to take it every day. So the pre-exposure prophylaxis, so if you have an individual who's sexually active, who doesn't use condoms, who uses tape, engages in unsafe sex, we suggest pre-exposure prophylaxis. And the data are good. We don't do this very well. And let me just call out to people that uh, in 2018, um, a CDC did a study looking at pre-exposure prophylaxis of the 1 million people they felt that in the United States that were at higher risk for getting HIV and only 260,000 plus, plus were um, using pre-exposure prophylaxis and the vast majority of them were not African-American. Only 1% of all those were African-American and 7% or so of those were Hispanic. The two groups we just indicated are at the highest risk for getting HIV. So we need to do a much better job of getting pre-exposure prophylaxis out. And so prevention is now the cornerstone of HIV uh, and ending the HIV epidemic. Thank you so much. Um, Michael, so, did, yeah, sorry, Dr. Colbert, uh, uh, Michael, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about post-exposure prophylaxis as well? Yeah, post-exposure prophylaxis is, depends on what we're talking about, post-exposure prophylaxis. So as there's a, a, so if you get a needle and it has HIV and you, in, you, you, you stick yourself, obviously you, you may get HIV in your blood. Okay, so um, in that regard, we try to treat you within the first four to six hours, all right, because, uh, and we can theoretically stop. Now, the general time frame for treating people for post-exposure um, interaction, so say you have sexual intercourse and you come to the ER and you say, oh my God, oh my God, I had sex and I'm afraid that I had sex with somebody who was HIV positive. Um, generally, we think that 72 hours 
gives us a good time frame to treat you uh, and prevent you from getting HIV. So those are the time frames we use. The time frame is not to, you know, I have to tell you that even though we use them, the data, not so great. Uh, because how do you do the study? Uh, I mean, so, uh, so 72 hours, there's an eclipse phase in HIV, which means once you get a virion infection, uh, it takes a number of uh, hours to days, many days before you become, it gets into the blood. So we feel that that's the period of time we have to capture uh, and, and, and treat the HIV if you do get an infection. So that would be post. Thank you so much. And we do have a question that came in. Um, what does a T cell count for an HIV in, um, infected person show? Yeah. So when I talk to my patients, I talk about two things. One is you and one is the virus. The virus is represented by the viral load. So the lower it is, the better. The second one is you. And you, I represent by your T cells, specifically your CD4 T cell, which is a subset, but your T cells. If your CD4 cell count is good, that's what we want. It means your immunity is preserved to a large extent uh, and you'll do well. If your CD4 count is low, it's one of the things we concern ourselves with that leads to the diagnosis of AIDS. So we want your viral load to be low and we want your CD4 count to be high. Thank you so much. Um, next question is, why is it important to change the stigma around HIV? Yeah, I couldn't agree with this more. I mean, we have lots of viral diseases currently. Um, hepatitis C, sexually transmitted. Uh, yet people can go into their office and get a blood test and hepatitis C and nobody blinks about it. Now that we can treat hepatitis C, it's great. So it's ridiculous in my opinion, and I use that term, that people uh, have been stigmatized when they get HIV. Uh, and this is a historical stigma that has carried through. But unfortunately, there are certain populations uh, that if somebody is HIV positive, they're, they're spurned, they're pushed aside. Um, I think we see this, and, and, and I don't wanna throw, you know, um, stones at any particular group, but let me just say uh, it has kept various groups from either getting the care that they need and getting it effective uh, treatment. And it makes it very difficult for these individuals because um, I've had patients say to me, don't call my house. I don't, nobody knows I have HIV and they'll throw me out if I have it. So stigma continues to be a big problem. People don't understand that HIV doesn't jump from one person to another. Um, and that unfortunately it's a disease that's with us now. Um, mm -hmm. And, and Dr. Cooper, Dr. Carasquillo, I, I've even heard um, individuals ask somebody else, are you clean um, in reference to do you have HIV? Which brings a level of if you have HIV, you're dirty. Um, that's why they ask if you're clean. So that brings another level of stigma as well. Um, mm, interesting. I mean, I think a lot of people think that a lot of the, you know, a lot of the stuff that's been spread about COVID, about misinformation, disinformation started with COVID. I mean, we saw this in the 1980s around HIV, where people were just spreading stuff that was totally false. And some of that stuff still sticks today, 40 years later, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, you see a lot of people that have no medical or scientific training still posting stuff about HIV that's totally false. And you're like, so this whole thing about disinforming and you know trying to harm our community started way before COVID did. Um, and you know, uh, with HIV, it's such a shame because it is a totally manageable disease, especially if you catch it early and you can prevent people from training. But um, you know, unfortunately, um, now that we have social media, it, a lot of this misinformation takes a life of its own. And you know, the amount of people that should know, you know, at a higher level jobs, you know, sometimes you even hear politicians talking things that don't make sense about HIV. You see or hear certain political groups saying stuff that's totally false. Um, and it's really sad, uh, it, you know, and it's similar to COVID. Uh, people are just trying to disinform our community on purpose. Thank you. We did have a question come in in the chat. In your view, 
Um, what is the distinction between PrEP and injection form and an HIV vaccine? Hmm. Well, we don't have an HIV vaccine at this time. I wish we did, uh, but we don't. Uh, and now, so using, uh, actually, uh, I like the idea of you having a, a, law, uh, a long acting injectable for PrEP better than for treatment. Um, all, but I like the idea of having it, but the question is, will people use it? What we find in PrEP, unfortunately, is that something I call PrEP fatigue. You know, people take PrEP um, and in a year, maybe 50% of them drop off. Uh, so if you had an injectable, which people would come and get, uh, then it would mitigate potentially some of the problems. We don't know this yet. I don't even know, um, I think PrEP is going to be approved, maybe January if it's not already, uh, the long-term injectables for PrEP. Uh, so we don't know until people start using it, how often it's gonna be used and how well people will use it because adherence to medication is critical. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Carasquillo, you mentioned a little bit about um, in the 90s and, and what um, exasperated the, the stigma about uninformed individuals, maybe writing things that weren't true. Um, that still holds true today, um, considering social media and internet resources. So what internet resources can be a trusted source of information that people can refer to so they know they're getting accurate information? And so we've done research uh, more recently around COVID about who most people think are trusted um, individuals. Turns out in most cases, doctors are still trusted uh, individuals. Um, so I would tell people, not all doctors, by the way, as we've seen in COVID, we've seen some doctors say things that are totally off the wall, but I would say 99% of all doctors, you know, ask your doctor about a lot of this. Um, Oftentimes, that's a very good source of information. But if not, go to the trustworthy work, uh, websites, the Centers for Disease Control, the National Institute of Health. Those are the kind of things that you know um, I would ask most people to turn to. Uh, there's a lot of other good, reputable sites that people can go to. Uh, Medline, for example, is one example. Um, but you know, the real sites put out most, depart most of the stuff that the departments of health have is actually pretty accurate, although you may disagree with politics in some departments of health, the actual health information that there is usually pretty good. That's so some of the general sources when people have questions about health issues that I usually link people to. Uh, but I would ask Dr. Kober, is any aid specific uh, sites um, that have good information? Well, I think you hit on, um, actually the CDC is great. Um, you can search in their website, uh, the aidsinfo.gov is a great resource. I give it to, uh, it, it can be technical, but there's also now a lay version, which means people can go there and read comments. So, and this is what we call a living document. They keep it up to date in an ongoing fashion on the medications, on opportunistic infections. Uh, and again, I caution people from getting their information through social media. Uh, you know, it's like the game telephone, it gets changed, uh, is all I can tell you. And, and, you know, this is the problem we're seeing nowadays. What I tell people, I do a lot of work around COVID messaging. It's, you know, uh, your friends, cousins, brothers posting on Twitter is not the most accurate source of health information. I mean, it's really sad, but we've seen it with COVID and you'll see it with HIV. Uh, with COVID, you saw people taking horse medicines. You saw people putting toxic chemicals in their body. Uh, been doing a lot of crazy stuff because a lot of the social media that was totally, you know, it's very scary what people are willing to believe in the social media sites. So certainly, if it's on social media, don't do it. Uh, there's lots of people selling snake oil down, out, usually with dot coms next to their names. Um, you know, AIDScure.com. I don't even know, but whatever it is, you know, all these. Uh, crazy websites that are trying to convince or sell people that are totally illegitimate. So stick to your doctor, stick to the official websites. Um, that, that's your real source of trusted health information. Uh, one other thing I forgot, you might, uh, there's something called the AIDS Education and Training Centers. Um, we of course have one in Miami, but uh, they exist and they, they do have a lot of literature on there, which is available. And 
the goal of that organization, which is uh, HR HRSA supported, is to in fact get education out to HIV providers. Uh, so it might be a good site for people to look at as well. Great, thank you so much for those uh, trusted sources of information. Um, a few more questions before we wrap up. How does my family history affect my risk of HIV, Dr. Kober? Well, unless somebody's given you HIV, uh, it doesn't. Uh, and again, you know, we do see families where people get infected, but again, that is the circumstance rather than the family. You don't get HIV because of your family. Um, I don't know what else to say to that. Nope, that's a great direct answer. That's what but we poverty like. Poverty does run in families. Alcoholism runs in a lot of these fundamental things, you know, run in families. But I think, yeah, totally right. And uh, Dr. Colbert, do you have any studies currently happening to help advance the study of HIV? So at the University of Miami, we have a lot of studies. Ending the HIV epidemic is a big, big effort. The Center for AIDS Research is in Miami, uh, one of the sites. There are 18. We are, have one. And uh, the whole thrust of that is uh, to um, understand and to get rid of HIV. We also have a center down there, an AIDS center. It's called Heidi, and it's to cure HIV. It's some a lot of research is going on in there as well. Uh, so we have a lot of research. I would encourage people. Uh, if they're interested, they can reach out to me and I can connect them or Dr. Tedeschio connect them and connect them to me. <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, I, we just have many, many studies on pre-exposure prophylaxis. We have a lot of studies uh, going on in ending the HIV epidemic. Mm -hmm. Jose, uh, could you uh, send them the website that University of Miami has for people that want to find out more about research studies at the University of Miami. Absolutely. They, you research Miami. I keep forgetting. I should know it, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That's another, uh, it's a lay, it's a site designed for the lay public to find mm -hmm. out about what studies they may qualify for. Perfect. University Great. And, and the city of Miami Department of Human Services will be more than happy to share that information with any residents that, that are interested. Um, I do want to dive in um, the last 10 minutes about the All of Us research and, and what's going on. But I do have one last question that I hope you can answer. Where does somebody get tested? Let's Wait, say they so don't have a doctor. Where can they go? Department of Health, there's a lot of anonymous testing sites. Um, you can go on if you are have if you don't have access to the web, go to the Department of Health. If you have access to the web, look for anonymous HIV testing sites. They're free, they're supported by the Department of Health, and they're available. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. And I can also vouch that the city of Miami, whenever we do host any type of health-related event, we do make it a priority to bring a mobile testing unit. Um, along with information from the CDC Act Against AIDS campaign, just to make sure we are we're, are doing our part in ending the um, pandemic. Alas, um, alas, sorry, uh, along those lines to Dr. Kober, uh, what do you think of those HIV tests that they sell uh, now to people directly? So the rapid tests are pretty good. I use the word pretty good because they're not perfect, but if you have HIV, they'll pick it up greater than 90% sensitivity, as far as I understand. I mean, obviously, if you, you know, it depends on the test, but if they're FDA approved, they, they have a high sensitivity and specificity. And so you could buy those right now. And certainly we have a lot of our outreach workers and do a lot of testing, sort of like the Department of Health and go out, um, you know, so it's very good. You could do it orally. It doesn't have to even be blood anymore. So there's a lot of different options that are excellent to be tested. And I know that the Department of Health has lots of mobile sites that go do, doing testing in different communities as well. So there's many different options on right now. Great, thank you so much. Dr. Carasquillo, um, diving into the All of Us research, um, how does All of Us research plan to contribute to HIV research? So all of us, first of all, it's, it's the biggest, you know, one of the biggest studies ever done. It, when it's finished, it'll have 1 million people. So it's by far the largest test. And so you think of a test of a million people and anyone could sign up. Um, 
first of all, it does enroll people with HIV. There's no, you know, there's no, as long as you're an adult, you could enroll in the study. Uh, so for those people that have HIV, uh, it'll, you know, be able to access you. It's a study of genetic information, medical record, blood tests, but a lot of surveys around things like the social determinants of health. So it's going to contribute a lot better to our understanding of a lot of these things about how these social determinants of health and everything contribute to HIV. And it's also going to follow your medical records for 10 years. So we'll see who develops HIV over the next uh, 10 years, for example, and also contribute about all these risk factors about who develops uh, HIV. So uh, it's going to be very helpful for many chronic diseases like HIV, um, you know, especially the ones that are really common in our population um, like this. Um, and it'll a brand new understanding. It's the biggest, again, massive data that links medical records, survey data. We're also gonna have information about your environment from the schools up as well. So it brings in a lot of different sources of information to help shed light a lot more on these things. Um, the ultimate hope is that once we know how all these different risk factors work together, we can develop very specific treatments that are tailored for each person. It's something that sometimes people call precision medicine or tailored medicine. Uh, but that's uh, the way that we're hoping all of us will help inform. I like to say uh, the next 50 years in medical um, and healthcare uh, based on the research findings. Thank you so much. Um, I did share the link for the clinical trials on the Facebook live feed. Um, Dr. Carasquillo, I did want to ask a couple questions. One, um, can somebody who already has HIV participate in the All of Us research program? Absolutely. Like I said, it's open to everybody. Um, okay. You know, certainly having people with chronic illnesses is something that we want to make sure is adequately represented. Uh, what we want to make sure is that we get enough people uh, with these conditions so that we're able to study them. It'd be a real shame if everyone we signed up did not have HIV because, you know, you want to learn about all these conditions and diseases. Uh, so we want to make sure that persons with HIV are appropriately represented in the study. So absolutely. And if anybody is interested in joining, what is the best way for them to? Jose will tell you, but it's, uh, what is it, Jose? Allofus.org? Uh... Yeah, so just copy and paste in the chat, uh, either the website or the phone number where you can call or text us if you are interested in learning more information. But as Dr. Karski mentioned, it's allofusjoin.org. Um, yeah, joinallofus.org, that is correct, Perfect. yes. My, Michael, Hi, Michael just joined us. Perfect. Hi, Michael. Glad to have you back. Sorry, we had a little snafu. Um, we started asking you a question about why would a person want to join all of us uh, study? Yes. Why would anybody want to join? And so we're talking a little bit about the benefits of participants, most importantly, informing the future of medicine, uh, sort of their contribution. But people do get back their ancestry results, which is really exciting. Uh, this year, right, Jose, we're going to start giving people back genetic uh, results. Some people find that interesting to know what uh, medical conditions they may be at genetic risk for. Uh, there's a very specific protocols. There's going to be genetic counseling with that available as well. So a lot of people find that really uh, interesting as well. Uh, and some people, even though it's a small amount of money, people do get $25. Some people think that's also uh, a reason they're participating. We hope that they're participating much more to help inform the future of medical research. Um, but those are all, um, you know, people find valuable. Uh, but yeah. people, uh, they're happy to be part of the community of all of us. They're part, are very proud and very part, um, you know, happy to be participants. They get updated emails asking them additional information and they feel part of a community. So I think that's also another big advantage of being part of a study. Great, thank you so much. Those are all the questions that we did have today. Um, I do wanna thank, um, both of you for joining us. This has been very informative. Um, I will be touching base with the All of Us research team to make sure that we are emailing, posting all of this information. Um, we will be saving um, this uh, webinar um, on different platforms and we'll be continuing working together as and to end this, this HIV epidemic. Um, any last words, uh, Dr. Colbert, Dr. Carasquillo? No, thank you very much. I thank the city of Miami Dade, certainly a major condition that we're all very concerned about. So thank you for helping uh, tackle this condition. And the more you could do to spread the word about some of the information that we've provided, uh, we're really grateful and thank you again. Um, and last, I'm sure you'll send the, 
the link uh, to Jose, who will pass it on to both of us. So thank you very much. Yeah, we'll much. post it also in our social media to uh, to distribute the information, to spread the word about HIV prevention and HIV treatment and the clinical trials and the All of Us program. Thank, thank you, you so much for joining us. And if you haven't got tested out there, go get tested. Thank you. <laughs> Have thank a you. great day, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you, Dr. Colbert. Thank you, Dr. Karski.